The book of James is one of the most powerful and practical in the New Testament. In this series of messages called Functional Faith, listen in as Pastor Chris Chadwick preaches from the book of James and learn where you can apply the Bible to your life today. We're in the middle of a series entitled Compare and Contrast that we started last week. I was supposed to start and finish talking about earthly wisdom versus God's wisdom. And the more I got into the study, James lists things that are in order and the grammar requires some special attention to be given. And the only way that I could finish it is to preach for an hour and 27 minutes. There is no way in grappling with the text that I would be able to finish it without doing it. What I think would be a 30,000 foot view of a very, very important passage of scripture as James is always important. All the Bible is important, but the book of James is so incredibly practical. And so we're just going to dive into verses 14 to 16 this evening. Would you grab your Bible and let's read, let's start really, let's do the whole paragraph, but our text will be 14 to 16. The Bible says in verse 13, who is a wise man and endowed with knowledge among you? Who's, who's wise among you? Talking to Christians, every, remember he's talking to Jewish believers everywhere. It's a, it's a, what's called a general epistle, not to one person, not to one church. Who is, who is a wise man and endowed with knowledge among you? Let him show out a good conversation, out of a good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. We looked at this last week. Uh, let him live his life in such a way that there's a, a meekness, a, a strength under control of godly wisdom. But, now we're, we're contrasting, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. This wisdom that he just mentions in verse 14, descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. When you contrast two things... It is really easy to bring them into light. It makes the lesser of the two more pronounced and the greater of the two better. If I had two things up here, two entities up here, the weaker of the two, if you immediately contrast them, would be immediate lo- immediately known. The better of the two would be immediately known. Now, I don't drink soda. Why do I not drink soda? Because I try to keep under my body and bring it into subjection unless that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a floating ship of soda. And I, I can't keep it in, in under wraps in my life. I love soda. It's like the best thing ever. But I, I, unless it's the only thing to drink or I'm flying and I, and I want free ginger ale, the only time I drink soda would be when I fly as a general rule. And so I don't drink soda. But when I did drink soda, the soda that I drank is the only soda that anybody should probably drink, and that's Dr. Pepper. I would drink Dr. Pepper. I like Dr. Pepper. There was a time when I was a youth pastor in Amarillo, Texas, and just out down the street from our church is a, a chain of convenience stores called Toot and Totem, and Toot and Totem used to have a big sale with another store right across the street, and it was, it was competitive pricing. I wish that somebody could explain that to our, the people in the White House. It's competitive private industry pricing, and it helped all of us, and they got 32-ounce sodas, and the lowest I ever paid for a 32 ounce soda was 13 cents. It was 13 cents a soda. By the way, they still made money. They still made one penny a soda because it only cost one penny. I'm sorry. It cost five cents for the cup, one cent for the ice, and to fill a 32 ounce up was three cents. So there was a decent profit margin in fountain drinks. And so we would go, and and I remember sometimes going there three or four times a day getting a 32 ounce soda, which is another reason I don't drink soda. 
That's incredible. That's, I'm still making up for having drank that much soda in my early 20s. And so, but man, when I drank soda, Dr. Pepper, how many of you, Dr. Pepper, is like one of your go-to sodas? Like if you drank soda, that's what you, how many of you couldn't care less? Anybody couldn't care less about Dr. Pepper? Really, really, some of you are weird. I love you. I thank God for you, but some of you are weird. But I love Dr. Pepper. It's Debbie's favorite. Matter of fact, Debbie, would, I had an uncle, my uncle John, John Simmons. John Simmons used to put Dr. Pepper on his breakfast cereal. That is not a lie. It was, it was, it was Lucky Charms and uh, Dr. Pepper. Uncle John's not with us anymore. He's with the Lord. And he really is. Why are you laughing at my uncle dying? Weep with them that weep for crying out loud. Do you have to re-preach this morning's message? No, uh, it is funny. And he really did. He's like, I hate milk, but I love Dr. Pepper. So he put it on his soda. He said Dr. Pepper was best on Wheaties. Um, I'm going to take his word for it. Some of y'all can try it and let me know. I also, as a kid, would drink Dr. Thunder. How many of you know what Dr. Thunder is? It's the Walmart knockoff of Dr. Pepper. Dr. Thunder <sighs> doesn't really taste that bad. It really doesn't. It's not that bad. It's okay. Like, you could drink it. Like, you could give it to Pastor Bernie, and he would have a sinful temptation of drinking that whole two-liter bottle right there. Like, Leslie would go, like, Bernie, what are you drinking? What are you doing? You're killing yourself. Our kids are going to be fatherless. And, and Bernie would be having shakes. They would be calling, you know, the, the police to try to get him, you know, out of, his, out of his bathroom that he's locked himself in. We'd have to do a wellness check. Why? Because Bernie came across a two-liter leader of Dr. Thunder. I mean, Dr. Thunder is really okay until you drink it right after you drink Dr. Pepper. If you drink Dr. Pepper and then you drink Dr. Thunder, Dr. Thunder tastes like trash. It tastes like medicine. You're like, what in the world? Why would I ever drink that? But if you've gone through four weeks without a soda and somebody hands you Dr. Thunder, you're like, oh, that's pretty good. That's why we used to just give kids Dr. Thunder. Why? Because it was about 10 cents a can. Dr. Pepper was 20 cents a can. So here, kids, have all the Dr. Thunder you want. I want a Dr. Pepper. No, we can't let you have it. You could never let kids have Dr. Pepper. Why? Because then they will know what the good stuff tastes like. Some of your parents are like, I don't want to withhold any good thing from my child. That's why you're in the condition financially that you're in. You withhold all good things from your child. Some of you aren't getting the humor at that, but Dr. Thunder. The compare and the contrast really comes into light as it, when you see it immediately. And James is writing here, and he's giving an immediate comparison and contrast with... Worldly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom. Wisdom of this earth versus the wisdom of God. And he's helping us to see the fallacy of worldly wisdom. Verse 14 to 16, we read it already. The fallacy of worldly wisdom, the, the falseness of the wisdom of this world, the problems with the wisdom of this world. Now, you might think that the wisdom of this world is okay until, listen to me, until you immediately compare it to the wisdom that is from above. And James says in verse number 14, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, lie not against the truth. Notice worldly wisdom's desire. There is both unbelief and belief, sin and righteousness in this context. And, and, and we understand the fallacy of worldly wisdom. We understand that, that Jesus, in verse number 14, you have bitter envyings and strife in your hearts. That, that in your heart is the, the source of belief and unbelief, sin and righteousness. Which is why Jesus talks repeatedly about the heart, about the center and the seed of, of human human emotion, about where you are personally, about what goes on in your heart, the condition of the inner man that is there in your soul. It, Jesus to the disciples on the road to Damascus in Luke 24, 25 said, O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. You foolish guys, 
Why are you so slow to believe what the Word of God says? Unbelief is foolishness to Jesus. Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, verse number 37, says, If thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest. And he said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And he's talking about salvation. And there might be somebody in here tonight that, that, that isn't sure that if they died, heaven would be their home. I want to say candidly that salvation is understanding with all your heart that you are a sinner, with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God, and with all your heart that you must repent. That means agree with God that you've sinned against him and put your faith and trust in Christ alone. And you have to do it with every fiber of your being. Not just some haphazard little thing. Not just some, well, yeah, kind of. The reason some Christians, maybe even some of you, fail to ever have true spiritual victory in your life is you've never really put your faith and trust in Christ completely. You're halfway there. You're almost all the way there. But you've never believed with all of your heart. I'm not here to make anybody doubt their salvation. That's not my desire. That's not my aim. That's not my intent. But I will say God commands us to believe with all thy heart that Jesus is the Son of God. Paul declares in Romans chapter 10, verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Talking about the heart, Jesus made it clear. Matthew 5, 19, for out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, murders, fornications, thefts, false witnesses. In your heart, the location of personal thoughts, emotions, conscience, listen to me, the inner man. In your heart. What goes on in your heart? And so when James says in this text, if you have bitter envyings and strife, in your hearts, in the inner man, it, it, it's imperative that we understand and we learn to control the heart that we have and what goes on in our hearts, which is why Solomon warns his son in, in Proverbs chapter 4, 24, verse number 9, the thought of foolishness is sin. Thinking about it in your heart, dwelling on it in your heart, not practicing it, just dwelling on it. The thought of foolishness is sin. Just thinking about it. Well, I've had people say, well, pastor, you know I'm just thinking about it. I'd never really do it. It's still sin. It's still sin. It's still sin to have the thoughts about that woman that's not your wife. It's sin to have thoughts if you're single about that girl that's not your wife or that guy that's not your wife. It's still sin to think about embezzling money from your job. It's still sin to, to, to think about getting lit up. It's still sin. Well, I wouldn't do it. I understand you wouldn't do it, but it's still in your heart. And we have to be so careful. To give attention to our heart. That's why Solomon said in Proverbs 4.23, we're commanded to control our thoughts. And he says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart. Protect your heart. Why? Because out of your heart are the very issues of life that are going on, the very, the, very, the, the very practical understanding and reality of life that we live. That's what's going on in our hearts. That's why James says, there's bitter envy and strife in your heart. See, worldly wisdom starts in the heart and we begin to think about it and it becomes the attention of our thought life it becomes the the direction he, even in verse number 14 he's dealing with some false teachers you remember in chapter 3 verse number 1 my brethren be not many masters knowing we shall receive the greater condemnation and, and he's talking about the tongue and teachers who teach falsely and act falsely all the way through verse number 12 he's dealing with the tongue and false teachers and 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 what they do and teachers who th teach the bible wrongly and then he comes here so there's a thought that it's in your heart and it's in your teeth and what's in your heart and in your teaching. Uh, you could teach wrong and you can think wrong. And it becomes the attention or the focus of your heart. It becomes what you talk about, what you think about, what you dwell on. 
It's, it's, we could say it this way. Often, it's what you watch on YouTube, which is kind of scary. <laughs> if you're me. <laughs> Last night, I was like, Debbie, I just want to watch something on YouTube. She's like, what do you want to watch? So I watched one of the things I love to watch the most. I began to watch guys cut down trees. <laughs> like, like, like there's this YouTube channel of these guys in Washington State who cut down these trees that are right next to folks' houses. It reminds me of my child because we had, we, had, we had these fir trees that were literally right next to our house, probably 70 to 100 feet in the air. And every once in a while, a windstorm would come and would knock them off. Praise God, he always protected our house. But that wasn't always the case for folks in our neighborhood. And they'll climb up these 125-foot trees and, and they'll begin to top them off and they'll work all their way down. And I began to watch that. I, that really intrigues me. I love, I love chainsaws. I love the smell of chainsaws. I love to work with a chainsaw. I love to work with a chainsaw with a sharp blade. I remember Lynn Swihart brought his chainsaw to work day one time. That brother might as well have brought a butter knife. That chain was so dull. It took us about five minutes to cut a branch about this big. And and I man, you give me a sharp chain and a sharp chainsaw. I love to work that stuff, man. That is so much fun. I enjoy it. I I was thinking about it. I was enjoying it. I went to sleep last night thinking about, about taking wood and splitting it and stacking it. And I thought, oh, what a day that will be. In heaven, I'm going to have a house on the beach in Hawaii with a pine forest all around me where I can do wood. I'm like, I don't think those work together. It'll be heaven. Becomes the attention of your thought life. I love to lift weights. I love Olympic lifting. If I'm not careful, I can, I can think about that all day long. I know you think it's weird, but I, it's just something that I enjoy, and it becomes the attention of our hearts. Here, Paul sa- or, or James says, if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Why does he say it this way? Because we see worldly wisdom's focus. It's a bitter envying and strife. The word bitter in the New Testament is used of taste. It's an it's a, it's a acrid taste. It's brackish. It's, it's sharp. Bitterness is pungent. You ever taste something that's bitter and you're like, oh man, that needs a lot of sweetener. I like some bitter things. I like coffee. I enjoy coffee a lot. I enjoy, I put sweetener in my coffee, but I enjoy it unsweetened. But this bitterness is a, is a far deeper bitterness. It's a, it's an unpalatable bitterness. In the Septuagint, this word, the same word bitter is, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This the same word bitter was used to indicate the fruit of a wild vine or bitter gourd that are so excessively bitter and acrid as to be a kind of poison. They, we read about it in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse number 39, that it makes whatever it's put into, it's unapproachable. You can't do anything with it. And truly, that's the heart of some people. Hebrews chapter 10, talk, I'm sorry, chapter 12 talks about that, that, that we need to be careful of any root of bitterness that springs up and everything is defiled. I, I was talking to somebody recently this week and, and we were talking about a situation that was going on and I said, you have to manage your bitterness. And they said, what do you mean? I said, if you get so enwrapped in a situation that, that the bitterness begins to grow inside you, you have to be spiritual enough to recognize that and you you have to get out of that situation quicker than you thought you should because the bitterness will spring up in all of our souls. And when it does, if it takes root or or it's already taken root, but if it springs up in our souls, it will defile everyone and everything that's around it. I'll be clear tonight on this point. The problem some people probably have here this evening is that you've never gotten over the bitterness of you fill in the blank. And you've never chopped that bitterness down. You've never gotten rid of this, that bitterness. Well, if you knew what happened when I was, I, I, 
I'm not minimizing anything that you're saying here, but I am saying this, that Jesus is the victory over bitterness and bitterness will destroy you and it will destroy everyone around you. And victory over bitterness is a choice to walk in the wisdom of God as opposed to the business or, or the wisdom of this world. And it doesn't matter if you're a male, if you're a female, if you're young or if you're old, bitterness always destroys. It can't do anything but that. Bitterness. He says, yeah, bitter envying. The word envying means jealousy, a, a, a greedy or a prideful longing for something that belongs to someone else, to another person, even something intangible such as a skill. Oh, I, I just... And, and, and there's a part that we're like, oh, I wish I could do that. Like, like Zane Garza played baseball growing up. I never played baseball really other than Sandlot never plays organized baseball. We say, why didn't you play baseball? A couple of reasons. Number one, my parents never let me play baseball. And number two, in high school, it was always during track season and I was gonna, I was gonna run track. So there was some competing interests that are involved. But as I look back in life, there's a part of me when I hear Zane talk about his baseball stories, how that, you know, there I was playing catcher and this was going on and that was going on. And I watch him and I'm like, oh, that would have been kind of cool. Or, or some of the ladies around here talk about fast pitch softball. I wish I played fast pitch softball. I had to be a chick to do it. But today, who cares? And, and so I, 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 there's a part of me that's like, I would, have, I would have liked to have been able to do that. I think that would have been fun. That would have been, and, and there's a difference between like, oh, that would have been fun and beginning to envy somebody for that, to be begin to like have a jealousy, a greedy or a pride for a longing that belongs to another person. Oh, they have a better job. They make more money. They're married. They have a relationship. They have kids. They have, they have just a bitter envying in their heart. But a bitter envying and strife is in your heart. He's a glory not, lie not against the truth. Why? Because worldly wisdom will hurt anyone who gets in its way. Worldly wisdom will hurt anyone that gets in its way. You see this word here in verse number 14. If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, the word strife represents a, a motive of self-interest. It literally means this, a mercenary interest. It, it means like, like canvassing, not in the sense of like putting flyers on door canvassing, like that, how we would use it, but canvassing for public office, which would be like scheming. This is the focus of the text. This person is filled with what we would say, self-ambition. They have a strong desire for personal success without any moral inhibitions at all. Whatever it takes to get to the top, selfish ambitions. They don't care about anything else. It's what we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 20. For I fear lest when I come, Paul talking to the church at Corinth, I shall not find you such as I would, and that I should be found of you such as ye would not. Lest there be debates, endings, wrath, strifes, backbinding, whisperings, swellings, tumults. Talking to the church at Corinth, I'm fearful that when I come, I'm going to find a lot of people in church, living in church with selfish ambition, even related to the work of God. I want that position. I want to teach that class. I want to give those announcements. I want to be the public speaker. I want to be the, the greeter. I want to be the one who, from this morning, I want to be the one who gets to clean the bathrooms. I, I, and, and it's just selfish ambition. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 20, talking about the works of the flesh, says this, that their idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strifes, same words, selfish ambitions, seditions, heresies, ambition to get to the top with no concern who you hurt on the way up there. No moral compulsion against stepping on someone and leaving a trail of heartache in your dust. But you got what you wanted. We can make this applicable to the home. You won the argument. You got what you wanted. Everybody kind of fell in a sense of line with you. You got what you wanted, but you left broken relationships and broken trust, and all of these things are broken in your life. But you did get what you wanted. 
You did get what you asked for. You were fighting and she finally just gave up. You were, you were manipulative and he finally just gave in. I mean, it, 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 you, you cried enough to your parents and they finally let you do it. It's just, that's the idea of the word strife. It's just selfish ambition. I want what I want. And I don't care who's in my way. I'm going to get it. That is the wisdom of this world. And James says, this ought not be named among you as believers. Worldly wisdom's going to hurt anyone who gets in its way. Look, continue to look at verse number 14. These, these verses are so packed. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. Notice worldly wisdom's delusion. Worldly wisdom and pride lies against the truth. It lies against the truth. Glory not. Don't boast about it. You know what? Sometimes we sin and as a means or we, we, we live in worldly wisdom and as a means of appeasing our conscience, what we will often do, what we will often say is, look what I got. Look how it turned out. James is saying, don't, don't boast about what you got through the means of worldly wisdom. Don't brag about the positive result of your worldly wisdom. Because the product was so bad, or the process rather was so bad, that the product will always be tainted. Yet you got what you wanted, but you lost so much. You lost so much. Glory not. And then he says, lie not against the truth. Well, lie. Don't tell an untruth. Don't pretend with the intent to deceive, which is what a lie is, to, to pretend with, with a, a, an intent to deceive. Worldly wisdom's delusion. It, 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 it's pride, and, and pride always lies against the truth. Do we have to look too far to see this lie against the truth? I'm, I'm, I'm tired of not speaking about public or, or, or relevant issues of our day. I'm going to speak about relevant issues of our day. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, I believe it's verse number 26, I yeah, and God said, let us make man. Matter of fact, why don't you turn there real quick? I want you to see this. Don't lose your place in James. We're coming back. I just want to illustrate this truth very, very clearly. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Now, now I'm not going to go too much into this, but let me just say this by way of edification. The word dominion means authority. I am not on the same level in the eyes of God nor any sane human being with a fish in the sea or a bird in the air or a cow in the pasture. Well, you're the top of the food chain. No, I am the top, meaning I, we, mankind, we are the top of God's created order. We are the top in God's created order. And to say that my beautiful little dog Molly at home that is sitting in her kennel outside waiting for me to get home. She's sitting by the door waiting for me to get home. She can't wait for me to be home. And when I get home, she'll be crying and she'll fall all over herself waiting for me to get home. Why? Because she's the smartest woman in the history of women. You say, how do your daughters feel when you get home? What up, dad? 
Molly is licking me all over the face, jumping all over me. How many of you men wish that your kids would meet you at home sometimes like my dog meets me? Yeah, I do too. And, and I have a great relationship with my daughters. They do a great job. But that, that's, that's the, the uh, Molly and I are not on the same scale in the eyes of God. Verse number 27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Verse 26, let's make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion. We're created in the image of God. Chapter 2. Verse number 21. And God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept, and he took up his rib and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. The Bible talks about elsewhere. Male and female created he them. Not only only is it clear in Scripture, it's obvious to every one of us that can look in human history. We can see the way that God created man. But there are men and there are women, and yet worldly wisdom, I'm not trying to be hateful, but I am trying to be biblically clear. Worldly wisdom says you can pick whatever gender you are. No, dear friends, God picked your gender when you were created. And that's not me being hurtful. That's me actually being very loving to help you understand you were created by the intent of a loving father who loved you so much that he said, this is my perfect plan for your life, and you'll find meaning and purpose and fulfillment as you live in that plan for your life. Lie against the truth? We have parades where <clears throat> men and women flaunt their worldly wisdom. This is just who I am. God made me this way. No, God didn't make you this way. I, I, the scripture is very clear. All we know about God is found in his creation and in his word. And God did not create you that way. God created you the way he created you and intends for you and has planned for you and prepared for you to find fulfillment by the means of his wisdom. Don't lie against the truth. I know it's not popular, but I'm not trying to be popular. I'm trying to help you understand what the word of God says. And don't glory in your sin. I, I'm disturbed at people who glory in their sin. I, I was on a ride along Friday night. A guy on a bike got hit by a, a woman driver. No surprise there. Don't lie against the truth, all right? Don't lie against the truth. <laughs> so I'm, I'm teasing. I'm teasing. That's just my only experience of people getting hit by cars. It's always been women hitting bicyclists. So that's just my, my experience. I got hit by a little kid. I still have bitterness. And I don't know, if Gloria, if you remember me getting hit by that lady. Now, it was a little bit my fault. I was a little bit of a daredevil as a kid. And we used to see how close we could come to getting hit by people on the main street. And so we would just go as fast as we could down the hill, hill and just keep our eyes closed. And I remember one time I looked back about a half of an inch. So every once in a while, I'll hang out with young guys and they're like, Pastor, am I scaring you? No, it just reminded me of my own self. That's uh, just all you're doing is reminding to me, but I got hit by a lady, and, and I loved it, because growing up in the 70s and 80s was great. Nobody thought about suing each other. My mom looked at me and said, you idiot, you broke the bike, what do you think you're doing? 
No lying. That's just exactly what she said to me. I'll never forget it. And then my friends came and got me, and they said, hey, Miss So-and-so, they hadn't lived in our neighborhood long, wants to talk to you. And I went up to her house, and she goes, it was up the hill from our house. And she said, I, Chris, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to hit you. And I just kind of stared at her like, please don't talk to my mom. Please do not talk to my mom. This relationship will end badly. She goes, I bought some Reese's peanut butter cups at the store. Would you like some? Oh, yeah. Oh, that sounds good. It was worth getting hit by a car to get a Reese's peanut butter cup. My parents were so broke and cheap, and they could have had all the money in the world. They weren't buying me a Reese's peanut butter cup. Now, let me tell you, they had a stash of them. And Sunday night after church, when we went to bed, they pulled out the good stuff. <laughs> I just want you to know, we had sugar-free candy that some old lady from church threw at us as she was leaving. But that's all we ever had to eat. But man, this, this lady, and I, 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 I remember those moments of, of life and, and and being a daredevil and, and being crazy. And this lady, this guy got hit in the car. I don't know exactly what happened. My job's not to investigate. My job's just to pay attention if I feel like it. And, and I'm watching, I'm watching this whole event and, and I see this dude's tattoos and I'm just staring at his tattoos. I'm talking to people, but I'm staring. If you've ever talked to me and you're like, I feel like pastor's staring off. I, I, I probably am. And I'm staring off, and I'm, I'm talking to these people over here, but he's right there, and I'm just watching, and, and I see the tattoos that, that are giving representation for some of the sin that he's done. He's glorying in his sin. I'm not speaking about tattoos, I'm just saying, he's glorying in his sin. He wants the world to know the sin that he's done. He wants the world to know the wrong direction that he's gone. He feels like, yeah, isn't this cool? Look what I did. It's right here on my arm or on my calf or on my thigh. He had a lot of them. Or all up here on my neck and everything else. There's a glory in that. By the way, believer, the Bible says, learn not the way of the heathen and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven for the heathen are dismayed at them. I would just encourage you tonight that maybe there are some things and some people and some groups that you just don't want to learn a lot about in this world. Glory not and lie not against the truth. Well, why is that? Because of the character of worldly wisdom or worldly wisdom's character, verse number 15. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. It's, it's not from above. Above is related to the character of heaven. Earthly wisdom is in no way related to heavenly wisdom. It's in no way related to heavenly wisdom. As, as, as weird as it is to drink Dr. Thunder and then Dr. Pepper, you can go, oh, there's some commonalities there. There's, there's a, a carbonation. They're both in a can. They both are brown in color. They, they both fizz when you pour them. They both kind of, if you stretch it, taste similar. And, and, and you can find some commonalities here. But between earthly and, and, and godly or heavenly wisdom, there, there is no relationship at all. No way they're related. It's earthly. The Bible uses this word. It's belonging to the characteristics of the earth as opposed to heaven. He, 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 remember, Hebrew writers didn't have exclamation points, so he's drawing emphasis this way, that this wisdom descends not from above, that earthly wisdom, this has nothing to do with God at all. It's of the earth. It's distant. It's removed. It's removed as far as it can be from heaven. It's removed as far as it can be. You could take all of the false teachers and all of the false doctrines and all of the cultic movements in our world today. They're, they're in no way related to heaven. People sometimes say there's a lot of parallels between Christianity and Jehovah's Witness. No, there's not. No, there's not. The very fundamental parallel of what do we believe about Jesus Christ is grossly different. It's not on the same parallel. It's not on the same plane. It's not on the same planet. It's not in the same universe. We believe drastically different. It's earthly. And then he uses this word, verse 15. Look at it. Circle it with your finger. Circle it with a pen, something. Sensual. A body governed by the natural and fallen instincts of man. The natural and fallen instincts of man. It's just sensual. 
It's, it's, it's governed by that which is appeasing to me in the moment. It's subconscious, if you will. It, it, it's, it's like a child that wants what they want in the moment and nothing can dissuade them because that's all that they can see. That's sensual. Some of y'all, that's how you think. I want what I want and I want it right now. I, I, I've got to have this. If I don't get this right now, I'm going to lose, lose my mind. So, so you'll go into massive debt or you'll abuse the marriage covenant or you'll abuse your body because you want what you want right now. That is sensuality. It's not always, this does not mean sexuality. I'm trying to be careful or exclusively that. We often use it for that. That is not what it means. It means just appealing to the senses. So that yellow Corvette that drives in front of you, you're like, I gotta have it. I'm not a Corvette fan, but I gotta have that Corvette. I, I've gotta have this thing. I've gotta have that thing. I, you're just like, that's all you can think about. That's sensual. It's devilish. Verse number 15. Characterized by a spirit of rebellion against God, it's demonic. Earthly wisdom, worldly wisdom is demonic. It is in violation of what God wants. It's in violation of what God desires. I know, Pastor, but my, my teenagers, they just, they just really want that. Dads, you are called to stand up and fight for godly wisdom. But they want what they want, and it's just, I'm tired of fighting. No, no, I know you're tired, but can I encourage you? Stay in the fight. Why? Because the, 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 the wisdom of this world is characterized by a spirit of rebellion against God. It's characterized by a spirit that is demonic. And then verse number 16, James helps us, and he says this, For where envying and strife is... There's confusion and every evil work. So where what we started with in verse number 14, and as we worked our way through, the product of worldly wisdom or the conclusion of worldly wisdom is confusion and every evil work. Would you agree with me that our world seems really confused right now? Yeah. I'm not going to make a political statement. I will make political statements. Don't act like, oh, good, he's not going to talk about this election cycle. Oh, no. We got, just so you know, just, and I'll, I'll say this again in the same tone when we get here. Romans chapter 13 that is talking about government follows Romans chapter 12. We're in Romans chapter 12. We'll finish Romans chapter 12 in two weeks. And then we're going to talk about government for a while. And you say, did you plan that? Not four years ago, I never imagined that I would do that. But yes, I planned it four years ago. No, I didn't plan it at all. But I will talk about it. But I am going to talk about this tonight. So just listen. We, we have the freedom to disagree, but we're going to disagree agreeably it's confusing that you have the candidate for a political party in the United States of America that has never talked to the media and has only sent out one communist policy statement and everybody is losing their minds with hope and joy. That's incredibly foolish and incredibly confusing. You say, well, I wouldn't vote for the other guy. Okay, fine. But how could you vote for somebody when you don't know what they believe? Because they're good dancers? Well, then Michael Jackson should have been president. You would have voted for Usher. Or that woman breakdancer from Australia. After watching her breakdance, I thought I could be an Olympic athlete for the first time in human history. I could totally do this. I could totally... 
It's like, she, would you get that off the thriller video from back in the day? Like, like, is that all you've got is broken down white people version of Michael Jackson moves? I mean, come on. I, it's terrible. It's terrible. But we live in a world filled with confusion. We live in a world that is confusing. Why is the world confused? Because the end state of, of living a life against God, the end state of a life of worldly wisdom is always confusion. It means disorder, instability, disturbance, rebellion, and even anarchy. It's like we're, we're seeing the book of James come to life in America. And he says, in every evil work. Now, this is the, the broadest possible category of, of bad results produced by bad human wisdom, just every evil work. It's just anything bad is what James is saying. Anything bad is because of earthly wisdom over heavenly wisdom. It means worthless, the worst, vile, contemptible. Noted scholar R.C. Trench comments on that word, every evil work, and and contemplates evil not from the aspect of its active or passive malignity, but rather from its good for nothingness, its utter impossibility of any true gain ever coming from it. I remember as a kid, my dad would often say, That's good for nothing. Well, Dad, I think we could use it now, son. It's good for nothing. Throw it away. Well, why do we have to throw it away, Dad? Because it's good for nothing. There's no way we could ever use that. There's no way it's, it's not usable. It's not useful for anyone in any way. It's a very, very broad term, but they include, this includes these words confusion and evil work. They, they include things like, if you're to say synonyms, anger, bitterness, resentment, lawsuits, divorce, racial, ethnic, social, and economic divisions, a host of other personal and social disorders. They include the absence of love, intimacy, trust, fellowship, and harmony. They're everything bad that's in this world. This is where the world's wisdom always leads. Is it any wonder that James started this chapter by saying, don't rush to be a teacher. Be not many masters, knowing you'll receive the greater condemnation. Be careful about the counsel that you give. Why? Listen to me, because as a believer, you are responsible for the counsel that you give someone. And if you exhort or encourage someone in their worldly wisdom, then you become culpable and your culpability thereby makes you responsible and you'll give a, a and you'll have to answer to God for this. You, you become culpable in their sin. Well, Pastor, I just want them to be happy. The world's wisdom can't lead to happiness. It only leads to confusion in every evil work. I want people to be happy. That's why I stand up and tell jokes and have a little bit of comedy routine in most messages. And, and, I, and I love, I want people to be happy. But true happiness doesn't come from, from temporary laughter or temporary pleasure. True happiness comes from a peace-filled, which we'll see next week, a peace-filled relationship with God. Well, I just, I think you, you say things a little harsher than I would. No, I'm just speaking heavenly wisdom over earthly wisdom. I, I want them to be holy. I, I want them to live at peace with God. First, by knowing that they're a sinner and they've been saved by the grace of God. They have a personal relationship with God, relationship with God that you know that when you die, heaven's your home because Jesus loves you and he died for you. And you can't work your way to heaven, but Jesus Christ alone is the means of salvation. And anyone who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ is guaranteed heaven as their home. I want you to first know that. If you're here tonight and you don't know Christ as your Savior, that is point number one, brother. You need to get saved. You need to accept Christ as your Savior. He died for you. But believer, 
Man, we are so inundated with worldly wisdom and living for the flesh and doing our own thing and going our own way and having what we want right now. And it always leads to confusion in every evil work. Don't raise your hands, don't nod your heads, don't say amen, don't do any of that. But how many of you can look at your life and look at the worldly wisdom that you followed and go, if I had to do it over again, I'd do it completely different because the product of what I did was so destructive. And the room is filled with that. Can I exhort you today to abhor worldly wisdom and replace it? We'll talk about it in depth next week, but replace it with heavenly wisdom. Verse number 17, the wisdom that is from above is pure, first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Our prayer is tonight that you just be yielded to the Lord, as we contrast worldly wisdom versus heavenly wisdom, that you would understand the malignity or the, the, the badness, the evilness, the vileness, the destructiveness of worldly wisdom. I know it gets packaged well, and the parades are good, and the, and the, and the balloons fall, and people cheer, and the music is good, and, and the sound is great. And you're like, oh, that is just so, so fun. Yeah, but it's this world's wisdom, and it leads to confusion, and it leads to every evil work, and there will be a day when you regret deeply your decision, and if God lets you live long enough, it, which he, by his grace he normally does, that you will come to a point in your life here on this earth that you will regret those decisions, wishing that you had followed principles of heavenly wisdom, and our prayer is tonight that you'll just inspect your life and go, my life has been filled with earthly wisdom. God, help me to follow your word and follow heavenly or godly wisdom so that I can live in the peace and the joy and the purity that you have called me to live in. That's our prayer tonight. That's our call to action tonight. That's what God has called us to this evening. Thank you for listening. Hear more messages anytime at CanyonRidgeBaptist.com. If you're in the San Diego area, please join us for a service. We meet on Sundays at 8.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m., and 5 o'clock p.m. We look forward to seeing you.